All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. This is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden, and I'm joined today by... David Malin, also of CS50. Good to see everyone again. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while since we... When was the last stream that you were on? Do you remember? Uh, it was good December. I think we played Zelda last oh, time. Oh, that's true. It was not a, as much of an educational stream as today. It was very educational. <laughs> now, a little bit of game development stuff. What game are we here to play today? I'm all set to, to accrue some points. It's a game called Docker. I believe it stars a whale of some kind. Oh, some yes. Some boxes on top of them. Indeed. Um, we have a bunch of people that were in here in the chat already. I see. Too. A lot of people have tuned in already. Nice we're, to see some familiar your names. We're almost at the magic number of uh, 50. We have 49 viewers currently. About oh, and after viewers. what happens after 50? Uh, then we just get tons of, just tons of money. Just <laughs> yeah. showered of money. Uh. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people in the chat. There's a lot of regulars. Um, I shouted out a bunch of people in the chat, but thanks so much for everybody who's joining. Dam Norell, Babic Knight. Uh, we have Bella Cures, Elias, Astley, Brenda, Mr. Frigg, uh, who I think is a new person, Coochie Snipers, Weeby, Izo TV. I think Izo TV was one of the first I'm people. I'm impressed you can pronounce all these so easily. I've gotten a lot of practice at this point. M. Kloppenberg, thanks for joining. Another regular for Sunlight, Suratan, JP Guy. Um, yeah, we got just an absolute ton of people. Oh, we got a first timer here. One uh, Jacques OTS. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Jacques OTS. Yeah, thanks so much for the follow. They, they followed up for the stream as well. Yeah. Nice. Hello, Illa Sorsa. Illa Sorsa, yeah, that's a new person as well. And uh, Adamantine Bipartite. What's up, David and Colton? What's up? Thank you. I, that's the first time I've seen that name. That's a long name. Yeah, we got a lot. Nice to see everyone yeah, here. Yeah, Ahmed Osman. And, Another uh, first timer from Adam. Yeah, M. Gonaimi says hello. Um, Whip Street 23, there we go. Another 52. Regular. Oh, we missed the 50. We, we, we blinked uh, yeah. and it was gone. We did, yeah. Um, so what are we, uh, what exactly is Docker? And that's what we, we sort of spoiled what we were talking about today. It's not actually a game. No, I'm sorry. So tune out now if you, you don't want to uh, learn something really interesting, though, technically. So Docker is containerization. Oh, we, your, uh, looks like your laptop is not. Oh, we're not plugged in. Oh, user sorry. error. Apologies. Sorry. sorry, that's my fault. I should have. If Colton's going to tell some jokes here for just a moment. Um, oh, man, I didn't have Did you hear about the, <laughs> the guy who, I don't who know. forgot to plug in his uh, dongle? Yeah, here we go. Let me go ahead and ch <laughs> Today's lesson will be about how to change your display preferences. Here we are going under scaled, so as to do 720p, which isn't actually very high resolution, but for our purposes of streaming technical content, makes it all a lot more readable on yeah. the screen. Oh, look, Brian's actually in the chat. says, hello, Brian U28. Oh, nice. Please send all of your questions to Brian U, who's here <laughs> from CS50. Team. Yeah, Brian, I'm sure knows a lot about Docker, too. All right, so let's begin again. So Docker is containerization technology, but what does that actually mean? Well, let's rewind a little bit. Normally when you're running software, it's on your Mac or your PC or your server or somewhere else, and you have installed whatever operating system was installed when you bought it or when you first set it up, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, or whatnot. The problem, though, arises in a server-side environment where you want to run multiple applications. Like CS50 has a whole suite of web apps. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, CS the CS50 sandbox. Sandbox, CS50 Lab, if you started tuning into CS50X 2019, we have Help 50 and Style 50 and bunches more. So all of these apps have their own dependencies, like certain software and libraries and frameworks that they need. And frankly, not all uh, apps need the same things. And so in yesteryear, only five plus years ago, we, CS50, used to have a centralized architecture for all of our web apps. We had what were called vHost servers, virtual hosting servers running popular web server software called Apache. And what we would do is we pretty much had to find the greatest common denominator among all of our apps and actually install on those servers every library and every piece of software that every app might possibly need. Um, the problem, of course, is that eventually you run into incompatibilities. One needs this version, another needs that, and now you're just out of luck. And if something breaks in one app, it's not isolated from another, and so one app can take down the rest. So Docker ultimately is about isolating your uh, applications from one another. And so it says on your, your web page there, what is a container? I'm guessing that the whale and the boxes on top of the whale are sort of uh, an abstract, like a uh, representation of this idea of containers? Indeed, indeed. We can pull this up if I uh, enhance this image up here. So Docker is a company that also makes and contributes to open source software, which is also called Docker. And indeed, you can see those little boxes represent those big, um, we call them containers, big that really containers. big tra shipping containers that tractor trailer trucks generally cart around. So it's actually pretty cute. Um, the whale is instead the ship, and it's holding up the containers. And it's really cute. If you want to go ahead today, 
today even install Docker, uh, at least on Mac OS, the first message that the software will print for you is, we are really glad to see you. <laughs> wow, that's a cringy. <laughs> a little bit, a little hard to say. <laughs> Um, but I should say, some folks out there might be familiar perhaps with virtualization software. Uh, for instance, has anyone used VMware or Parallels or other such tools? Those are That's certainly been around for a while, a long, a long time. much longer than Docker has, and I know I've, I've definitely used it quite a bit. Yeah, and we use those too, but with virtualization software or virtual machines or virtual machine monitors, a bunch of different ways to describe essentially the same thing, you would have to run, you could run multiple operating systems on your same computer computer, essentially each OS in its own window. The problem with a VM or virtual machine is it virtualizes the entire hardware, the CPU and the memory and the disk and the files and everything, so it actually is a lot heavier weight. Like you have a lot of redundancy. If you have Linux in your, in your virtual machines, you have that as many copies of Linux running and installed as you have virtual machines. So Docker, part of what Docker does is sort of mitigates that resource use on your machine. Indeed, indeed. So I pulled this up in advance, uh, one, to learn what Docker is, uh, and two, to actually show some of the fun pictures that they have that actually do paint a nice, a nice picture here. I think if we scroll down, yeah, indeed. So here on the right, this is just on docker.com slash resources slash what dash container. Um, on the right, you see an artist's rendition of what a virtual machine is. At the lowest level, you have your hardware, your infrastructure, like the physical servers. The blue bar above that is the hypervisor, aka virtual machine monitor, aka VMware or Parallels or other software too. And then on top of that, conceptually, you have maybe Windows installed and Linux installed and maybe Mac OS, but Apple does not make that easy, otherwise known as your guest operating systems. And on those guest operating systems, you have your individual apps each running. Okay. So now if you look to the left, what, what seems to be missing, for instance? Uh, well, there's no virtual machines separating the apps. They're no. all running on the, in sort of the same bucket, which mm -hmm. is the containerized applications. Uh, arrow, that's what that's referring yeah, exactly. to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, each of those apps is a containerized application, yeah. which means it's each app is using Docker. Docker is now the software beneath them that makes all this possible. And notice you only have one operating system. Yeah. So you run, for instance, uh, Linux or something on your own base computer, and thanks to Docker, can you now share just one other operating system, for instance, uh, uh, if you'd like, across all of those applications. And moreover, and most excitingly, if all of those apps, A, B, C, D, E, F, are all running Ubuntu Linux, version 18, well then what you'll have is one base installation of Ubuntu, and if app A and B need slightly different software, they're just going to be layered on top. Uh, Docker supports what's called a union file system. So if we both have apps that we've written using Linux, but I need uh, a, a library called Foo and you need Bar, we'll share the same base layer, but for you, Docker will layer Bar on it, but for me, Docker will layer Foo on it, but still have that commonality. We both need two different versions of Ubuntu. Does it do similar, similar type it, of thing? It does. You go a little lower level, but then each of us has our own copy of Ubuntu 15 or 16 or 18 or whatnot. And then, yes, those are isolated from each other. OK, pretty cool. Yeah, so it sounds like it factors out a lot of the bulk, the unnecessary bulk yeah. associated with running multiple VMs. Indeed. Exactly. Um, I know we definitely have a bunch of messages here. We All right, well, let's see. catch up on Some these. Some people definitely uh, talked about Apache in here. People are asking, what is Docker? I wear Docker. I think it's a, a clothing brand. Um, try to do this in code recover, 55 people. Um, yeah, people there we go. Box. This is what we'll be talking about today. <laughs> yeah, <we're laughs> okay. CS50 fashion. Um, uh, for someone asks, is it a simulator or an emulator? And they're talking about Docker. Um, it's technically neither. It is in and of itself its own technology. Um, yeah, I mean, it's closer, I think, to a virtual machine than to either of those, where those are implementations truly in software of just one specific runtime. But emulator is pretty close to virtual machine. Um, there's just a little more sophistication, I think, under today's VMs, because you're virtualizing an entire architecture and the operating system on top of it. And they're saying David Sir is fun. Oh, nice. So you get all the views today. Left looks like hosted VM, and the right is a type 1 VM, is what For Sunlight said. 
um, okay. on the screen there. Train to Solace City offline, but it needs Docker. Could you at some point in this video explain? That's a perfect segue, actually. Okay. Let me, uh, just so folks can play along at home if you would like. Um, I'm not sure Colton and I alone can provide technical support for everyone who wants to try this, but if you Google uh, Docker download, odds are that will lead you to this page, docker.com slash get dash started. And it's actually pretty straightforward to get Docker up and running on your machine. So what we did in advance of today is I'm using a Mac right now. You can click on download for Mac. That's going to take you to a longer, harder to pronounce URL. And if you scroll down here, you'll see a number of different versions of Docker. For instance, Docker Desktop. And you can scroll through, follow these instructions here, and actually uh, go about getting this up and running on your own Mac. And it looks like, let's see here, looks like they're going to make you download. you got to log in these days because they want to get your email address. Then you can go ahead and download Docker for Windows or Mac OS or Linux for free. So feel free to do that behind the scenes if you'd like to play. Cool, cool, awesome. Uh, you can use Windows Education if you can get that through school. Um, we're talking about Windows. If you use Windows, you need the Pro version of Windows. Is that oh, anything maybe. to do with like CPU virtualization? I know that that's something that. No, it probably has to do with licensing, honestly, uh, yeah. and charging more for the fancier support. I know Windows Education is very, very generous. Um, ba -ba -ba, Windows Education is greater than Windows Pro. Uh, is Docker used for web apps? It says adamantine bipartite. It can be. I mean, Docker is agnostic to what you do with it, which means that you can any you can run any type of software inside of a container inside of Docker, which is the very specific product we're talking about. Um, so yeah, in fact, all of C every. Is this true still? I think every one of CS50's web apps is in fact Dockerized or containerized, to say it more generically. Um, so yes. And then Indeed. we have some other apps that are not web apps. Like, I think, is Check50? Uh, Check50 is, is also Docker. Dockerized, yeah. 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 That's the CLA. Um, Oh, and uh, do we want to point people to the CS50 doc? Do we have a CS50 doc? Sure, let me pull that up. So I'll zoom in on this URL. If anyone wants to see some of CS50's own documentation, you can go to cs50.readthedocs.com. I plugged it in the. Uh OK, nice. Colton just pasted it into the chat. And you'll see documentation for all of our stuff related to Docker and more. And in fact, I'll pull these up very specifically soon. But someone mentioned the offline IDE earlier. If I go ahead and scroll down to, uh, let's see here, IDE, CS50 IDE at the bottom, you'll see a mention of offline. And these instructions will walk you through the process of starting to get your own IDE up and running locally. To be fair, there's a little bit of complexity. Um, and not, uh, I definitely uh, plan to get more comfortable with Docker as you do that, because you can do uh, quite a few more things with it as well. Cool, cool. Uh, can I have a server on it? Is it better installing Docker to a dedicated server or using a CLOD instance, which is a VM, also uh, like more layer? What will be better in the context of performance? Oh, I mean, anything running on bare metal, so to speak, without a virtual machine is going to give you somewhat better performance because you got to pay some price for having the virtualization. With that said, it's a little annoying to install things on bare metal, so to speak, these days because if something goes wrong or you want to reinstall, you have to wipe the whole thing, whereas installing things on a VM isolates it from everything else. So it really depends on your own. I would not be worrying about performance just yet if you're just trying to learn Docker and you want to experiment. Do what is easiest. And honestly, do it on your own Mac or or PC, assuming the hardware in your version of the OS will support it. Docker is uh, PAS or IAAS? Uh, Docker enables IAAS, which is a funny acronym these days for infrastructure as a service. These are things like AWS, Amazon Web Services, or uh, Microsoft Azure and Google Compute Cloud. But it really is a piece of software you can use on your infrastructure so as to do anything higher level. Platform as a service is something like Heroku. Docker is not a, a, a web application like Heroku is. It, it's lower level, so it's related more to IAAS. Yes. Cool, cool. Um, and then would Docker containers be a similar concept to Ubuntu Snap? <sighs> sort of. I don't know too much about Ubuntu Snaps. We're still just using uh, apt get install and such on our setup. Um, but my understanding of Snaps is that it's a cleaner way to distribute individual software packages. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Docker and containerization more generally is about uh, containerizing an entire operating system um, and everything therein. So it's probably fair to say that Docker has a, is a bigger product, whereas uh, Snaps, I think, are more isolated to individual uh, client side, well, not even client side, individual pieces of software. Containers give you a whole environment. Cool, cool. I think we're all caught up on, uh, on all the questions here. If you want to maybe start diving into uh, 
some documents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go ahead here and uh, let's get started. So here again on docker.com slash get started is where you can probably download this for yourself if you would like to play along. But I think it's perhaps most fun if we just dive in by way of example, see what's going on, and then actually understand hopefully like how we built these various tools. Sure. Yeah. Um, with CS50, we have a few different use cases for Docker. We run all of our web apps using Docker in the following way. We write um, our web app locally on our Mac or PC. We push our code to a GitHub repository or any repository. We then automatically build the code, installing anything we want. But we do this by way of what's called a Docker file. It's just a text file, which is a configuration file that just specifies line by line what pieces of software do you want this application to need and therefore install for you. So why don't we go ahead and take a look? Um, why don't we go ahead and open up a terminal window here. And I've got another one ready to go when we get to another topic too. And I'm going to go ahead and run uh, vim, which is a command line text editor here. And I'm going to go ahead and open up a file called uh, docker file. Actually, let's do this. Let me go ahead and uh, make a directory called twitch, just so that we have somewhere to work. I'm going to go ahead and now run uh, vim on docker file. So I've just got an empty file in which I can do really anything I want now. Now you would only know the syntax for docker if you actually read the documentation or followed along here at home. And I'm going to go ahead and say something like from Ubuntu 18.04. From I've capitalized, that's a docker command. Ubuntu is the name of a docker image, a snapshot in time of some base installation of Ubuntu. And the colon 1804 means that's the specific tag. So Canonical, the company that makes Ubuntu and the whole ecosystem out there that uses Linux, uh, installed for us into a file Ubuntu with a whole bunch of packages and specifically tagged it, this is release 1804. What that means is that my own application, whatever it is I'm building here, is going to be based on Ubuntu 18.04. So let's go ahead and, and uh, run Docker and see what happens. If I go ahead first and run Docker and type PS, I'll see all of the containers that are running on my Mac, which at the moment are none. I don't actually see anything. Docker itself is running. On Mac OS, I can see this here with the logo in the top, and this is where the menu is and you can see Docker desktop is running. If you're on Windows or Linux, your menu is going to look different. It's going to be somewhere different altogether. But the fact that it's running is a good thing. And that's why I was able to run Docker PS. It queried the underlying server software. I'm going to go ahead now and say, go ahead and Docker run a specific um, image. And I'm going to go ahead and actually, no, sorry. I'm going to go ahead and build my current image and say, go ahead and build uh, this thing here uh, called dot, which is my current directory. This is in the Twitch folder. This is in my Twitch folder. So there's really nothing interesting going on here yet because all that file had, the Docker file, was that one line. But notice what happened. So as soon as I ran that, step one of one was from Ubuntu 1804, Docker went ahead and pulled, so to speak, from its library of free images and installation of Ubuntu. That image happens to be broken down, and you only know this by looking at the results, uh, into four layers, so to speak. I mentioned uh, union file system before, so odds are one of these layers Layers is like the very first pieces of software that are installed by Ubuntu. The next layer, it goes on top of that, then the third, then the fourth, and each of those has additional packages or files, most likely. Would it be accurate to say like one or one of the first two layers would be like the kernel of the operating system? Yeah, that's most likely. Probably more or less the same amongst. Um, well, I don't know if it would be the same amongst versions of Ubuntu, but... It depends. We'll see a bit more of this when I add to the Docker file in just a moment. We'll see exactly what each of these lines corresponds to. Okay. So this is just a SHA-256 hash, which is like a big, seemingly random string that uniquely identifies this version of the image. Uh, you'll see that my status was successful. It downloaded a newer image, because I didn't have any, for Ubuntu 18.04, and it successfully built this hash. So these are the last, what, 10 or 12 characters of a longer SHA-256 uh, hash that uniquely represents now my application. I'm in a Twitch folder. If I type ls, the only file I have is docker file. So I've got nothing interesting in this, code, in this folder yet, but I now have a unique image that I can now run. So I am on Mac OS. Let's see if we can see this. If I do uname, you'll see that I'm running Darwin, which is the code name for Mac OS. If though, I do docker run dash it, and I'll come back to some of the command line arguments later, that particular unique identifier. Let's cross our fingers, and oh my god, I now 
am inside of Linux, right, nice. running on my Mac. Now, I, I feigned surprise. I kind of knew or hoped that would happen. But indeed, if I type ls now, you'll see a whole bunch of folders that are not on your Mac or your own PC. They are now local to this container. And so curiously, Excuse me. Um, I seem to have this base in the Linux file system, but you can actually mount files from your own Mac inside of this container. So let me take a step back. I'm going to go ahead and do, I think, exit, which gets me out of that. Now if I type uname, I'm back in Mac OS. Okay. And if I type ls now, there's my Docker file, and none of those blue folders are actually there. But if I do this, and I'm, I'm going to have to remember the syntax, if I do docker run dash it, dash v dot colon, let's say MNT for mount. I don't quote me on this just yet. And then paste in that image. Uh, nope, volume name is too short. Let's see. Uh, vol nope, maybe it's capital V. Nope, docker run. OK, we're going to run docker run help <laughs> to see how to mount volume. Find and mount a volume. Mount directory. I'm David blanking on how to do this properly. Uh, let's go ahead here and do this once more. Docker mount. Damn it. Uh, That's no. part of the fun of the live coding stuff. Yeah, this is not what I wanted to do. Volume name is too short. OK, so here, folks, we're going to do Docker mount directory, since I have essentially aliases for all of these things. Yeah, dash V. That's what I want to do. So here, folks, we're going to introduce you to a website called Stack Overflow. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. Oh, I might need to do a fully qualified path. No, let's try this again. All right. Sorry, folks. Also, adamantine, bipartite, illosaur, and gigantorex 911. Thank you very much for following. Appreciate oh, it. Very welcome. So let me go ahead and try this. Docker run dash v slash mount and now dash it and then this image. OK, nice. I'm sorry. It's just I think I needed the fully qualified path and not the dot. So that's just me being stupid. Apologies. So now, what does this actually mean? If I type ls, because I'm now back inside of that Linux environment, all seems to be fine. But if I go into this MNT directory, which is a Linux convention for a folder in which you can mount stuff, a CD, a hard drive, a folder, or whatever, and type ls now, you'll see that that file from my Mac is inside of the container. That's pretty cool. Which is neat, because now I can use Linux on my Mac, but still access my files, any of my Mac actual files. Yeah, that's a nice thing that uh, some VMs have a little bit of issue with sometimes, too. Yeah, and now, funny enough, Let's try this. Now I'm inside of Linux. I'm going to go ahead and run Vim. And uh-oh, what happened to my Vim? Yeah, I guess it's not a default program in um, Ubuntu, at least, yeah, 18.04. Exactly. It doesn't seem to come with at least the base image that uh, the folks out there have created for folks to use with Docker. So uh, on Linux, if you're unfamiliar, you can do apt get install and then something like Vim to install software. Unfortunately, it doesn't even have the cache of local packages. So in this world, you do apt get uh, update. And that should now download from Ubuntu's web servers or CDN all of the latest indexes of like the software that's available. Or like a DNS server almost? Uh, not, DNS. not so much DNS. It's, it's a package manager apt. And it, um, because it like, almost puts a DNS on your machine that then allows you to fetch a package using a name. Um, sort of, maybe? I wouldn't conflate it with DNS, honestly, because I think that goes a little too low level. This is like Windows Update or the App Store, just checking what the latest software is, honestly, that's available. So now if I do app get install Vim, you're going to see a whole bunch of crazy messages because Vim needs all these dependencies. Do I want to continue? Sure. I'll type Y for yes, hit Enter. And now inside of this Linux container, inside of Docker, I now have just installed software. I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen just to get rid of this distraction. And I'm going to go ahead and do Vim now. And voila, now I'm running Vim. Nice. But notice this. If I hit Escape and quit out of Vim, which itself is kind of a feat sometimes, and now I go ahead and exit out of the container, rerun the container, and run Vim, it's gone. So it's ephemeral. It is, at least in the way we've configured Docker, now I have a pristine, clean environment. Interesting. Both a good thing and a bad thing. If you want it to be isolated from everything else, you now have a deterministic starting point. Bad in that, oh my god, that just took like two minutes. Now I have to do it all again. OK. So how do we do it again? Well, let me actually exit out of Docker. And in Mac OS, just to be clear, here's Darwin. I'm going to run Vim, which is already installed by Apple for me on my Mac. I'm going to open that Docker file. And now we're going to create another layer. So this from command gives me a base layer with all the default Ubuntu software. Now I can go ahead and do this. Run apt get install 
vim, but I need to be a little smart about this, uh, but not yet. Save it. Now I'm going to do docker build dot to build my current directory, and you'll see unable to locate package vim. Does it have, do you have to do the app get update first? Yeah, exactly. Well? So we'll see that this uh, returned a non-zero code. Like my build of my container didn't work. So I'm going to go ahead and open that Docker file again. And I'm going to do apt get update and then run apt get install vim. Can you do like a semicolon space and then apt get install vim or will that work? Uh, you can. So let's come back to that because I specifically want to see these two runs for sure. just a moment. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and save that. Let's clear the screen and rerun docker build dot. Cross our fingers. You'll see it's doing more work when you build the container now. And you only have to build your containers once. Unfortunately, it failed again. Uh, OK, because it looks like it's asking for yes or no. And I don't know how it would know how to get that input. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is meant to be an automated process. And yet here I am just expecting it to know right, uh, yes from no. So it turns out you would only know this by reading the documentation or the man page. If you actually say dash y, you can uh, proactively say, just say yes to any questions that get asked. Okay. So let's go ahead and save this, clear the screen, docker build dot, and now notice, notice what it didn't have to do a moment ago. Notice that it's immediately trying to install Vim, but notice that on this line, run apt get update, it's using the cache this time. Okay. And that cache has a unique hash identifier, which means all that work we did last time, we do not have to do again because we baked it into a, a layer. OK, so some stuff will be ephemeral and some stuff will sort of be saved. Exactly. Cool. Anything you put in your Docker file will persist by way of the uh, file system layers you are effectively creating. OK. Let's go down to the bottom. And you'll see successfully built. And all the stuff above refers to Vim having been installed. Now, this unique identifier is different from before. The other one, I don't think, started with F9. Yeah. So now this is a new image on my Mac. So I'm going to do, if I can get this right, um, forget the directory, docker uh, run dash v for volume, users j harvard twitch colon mount, but you can mount it anywhere inside of Linux if you want, dash it for reasons we'll come back to, and then this new hash. Enter. I seem to be inside of the root account of Linux, and right. indeed I am. Now let's go ahead and run Vim, and it's there. It's and cool. now if I quit, exit out of the container, rerun the container, top random again, now it's persisting. Nice. OK. Solve that problem. Indeed. I'm assuming we could do a lot more complicated stuff than install Vim. Yes, you could build entire <laughs> applications. But notice this. Suppose now that I didn't quite appreciate what I was doing and I did docker build dot. Oh, maybe I need to build my image every time. Mm -mm. Notice, but done. It's all cached because it was in the Docker file. Exactly. And yeah. you can see here that every time we had a run command, step one, step two, step three, we got a new uh, identifier for that layer. And so every one of these run commands or a few others in Docker files gives you a new layer that just keeps getting layered on top and top and top. Would you do you want to ever make those changes not persistent? For example, maybe it fetches remotely a library that could change day to day? <sighs> yeah. Um, short answer, yes. And the best way to explain that, how best to do that? Um, if it's too complicated, we don't have to. No, no, you can. Um, let me show, let me give a teaser of something we'll perhaps see a bit more of later. Implicit in a Docker file is this last line here, and I might be getting the specifics a little off, is essentially this, command bash. So by default, if you don't specify a command, the Docker container is just going to spawn bash, which is a shell that is an interactive prompt for you. You can override that. So you could do something like, by the way, at the very last minute, do apt get install dash y foo to make sure you have the very latest version of foo and then go ahead and run bash. Okay. That would be one workaround to that that comes to mind. OK, interesting. Indeed. Let's make sure we didn't miss any. Yeah, let's catch up on any so questions. That was really good, though. Um, Thank you. <laughs> we have a bunch of stuff up here. We're just trying to figure out where we left off. I think this is roughly where we left off. So our LXC container something similar to Docker container? Yeah, LXC is just another approach to containerization. It's not Docker. It's just a different technology. But that, too, is quite popular. Sigmund Penny saying LXC is para-virtualized, if I'm not wrong. That's a word that I've never seen before. Yeah, there's some differences. And I'm not good at appreciating the, the differences here. Um, I think, frankly, Docker has a really nice and user-friendly ecosystem, which is just why I personally gravitated toward it early on. Zweeb is saying, if you're an Inception fan, you can install <laughs> Linux subsystem for Windows and then add Docker to that. That's right. 
right. And then you can run Windows and Linux on top of it, and Linux on top of inside of that, and even Linux inside of the Linux in Linux. But you have to start hacking around to make that possible. And then your computer will just not. Yeah, function. just that's bad. You, no need to add too much overhead here. Um. Bah, bah, bah. Okay, we're oh. No problem. I think you were apologizing when you had. Well, no. Let me scroll up here. The oh, the blah blah comment. Docker volume create. I didn't want to create a volume. To be clear, I wanted to mount an existing directory on my existing Mac into the container. Sure. But that is another way. Maybe maybe you're actually responding to the other goal. You can create persistent volume so that everything in slash temp or slash user local or whatnot actually does persist on your Mac and gets remounted every time. Okay. Um. So we're talking about the first few lines for running Linux. Yep, indeed. Um, use Nano. Vi is the default. Um, we could try. Wait, here we're getting try Nando. Sure, we'll try this. Um, so I want to go ahead and just run Docker run again with this command. Nano. I'm sorry, it's not installed. Vi now is because it came with Vim. Okay. Does it have? Uh, does Linux Ubuntu have any editors that come with it by default? Well, it depends what you mean. Distributions of Ubuntu, distributions of Linux come with different packages. I guess this layer then is what I, I guess more technical. So short answer, no. And let me pull this up in just a second. Um, the image that's made available by Canonical or whoever uh, for Docker is it by design super, super small. Honestly, if you have a server-side environment, the goal of which is to isolate the app from every other, no human should really be SSHing into that container and doing anything with a text editor. To be fair, probably every one of us, if you're, do, if you're if a sysadmin, have done this before. But you're just wasting bytes and megabytes. And just by installing Vim, my god, you're slowing down the build for your server-side application. Probably doesn't need to be there by default. That's all that's going on here. Okay. Makes sense. If you download and install Ubuntu on a CD or an ISO, then odds are it, yes, has a text editor. I think Adam Mantine and Beth Partnett was saying uh, way up above that they were doing all the CS50X stuff. They're working on the final project. So uh -huh. that's pretty exciting. Nice, nice. And then someone else is saying that they're on there. 5 Roman. Bob, all right, Bob catching Bob. up. Good. Um, probably the hardest one says Adamantine, piece, referring to PC at five. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're saying just, pa just a package manager was um, apt to get. Can we see the GUI in Docker? Says for sunlight. Is uh, there, there isn't really a GUI here. You could certainly run in Docker an operating system that then has a window manager like XFCE or something else with uh, GNOME or something on top of it. I don't have an X server installed, so even though we could install all that requisite software, I couldn't without wasting some time. Um, pull up an actual GUI, but you could do it. But for the most part, Docker is not about giving you a pretty user interface. It's about giving you um, an isolated installation of some OS and some app. Um. Uh, Vi versus Vim. I don't know the difference. I'm guessing they're just version differences, probably. Uh, Vim is Vi improved, so it's like the new and improved version of Vi, and oh, right. mostly they're tip Vi is typically aliased effectively to Vim, so you wouldn't notice the difference anyway these Definitely days. Neo Vim is Vim more more improved. <laughs> okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Person like VS Coder Adam never using a Vim from the Netherlands. Okay, we're getting a little distracted by text editor debates yeah. here. <laughs> Um, oh, I think Sigmund was saying you don't want to separate the commands into two layers, referring to um, there are two run commands. Yeah, really. so that's actually true. And you meant, I mentioned this earlier when you uh, proposed as much. If I go back into my Docker file, I probably don't want to decouple the updating of my sources list from the installation because those really are one uh, should be happening both together so that when I've updated the list, I'm installing uh, based on that list. So I'm actually going to pull this up onto the first line and do something like and and. Um, this is better than typically doing something like this because and and, these are two separate commands. And and is going to ensure logically that this whole line will only succeed if both the left command and the right command oh, it's like succeed short for me. Logic and programming. Yep, exactly. Thing. So this would be a better way. And it also creates one layer. Couch is the layer itself is going to be a little bigger, but for installation of software, that tends to be the best practice. Okay, cool, cool. Stream is more users than the super streams. Cool. That's good. The educational content is successful. I don't know. I kind of miss playing Mario Brothers. Yeah, well, we have to I thought we were playing Excite Byte today. I was be. led to believe that. Yeah, it's like a, the, old, uh, the old carrot on a stick. Um, I finished Spell Checker today. I think it's just examine your programming way of thinking. Nice piece. Of nice. Congrats. Um, what was that one up here? I personally, personally struggled over with Recover. Took a oh, break. C Primer Plus book. OK. Oh, nice. So you finished Speller. That's pretty quick, actually. That's great. Uh, I want to show off how layers work, says Segment Penny, I think. Uh, okay. One of the, maybe one of the next things to talk about. 
Um, or the entry, entry point. point. Yep, that's actually a step before the command. Mm -hmm. And I think you read off this question. Can yep, we did that. We have a container. Hi, Hi from Peru. Hi from the US in all caps. Hello. <laughs> Digivolts. <laughs> I uh, just installed Ubuntu VM using VMware machine. Should I have used Docker instead? Good question. Um, so just to read it a little more slowly, uh, David, I just installed an Ubuntu VM using VMware on my machine. Should I have used Docker instead? It depends. Um, if you just want to have Ubuntu available to you uh, and persist all of its state and just be like a locally installed operating system, no, the VM is perfectly fine. That's what we used to do back in the day. Uh, with that said, I personally have transitioned to using containers for everything. They start nearly instantly, where it was a pain in the neck years ago to run VirtualBox or uh, VMware on my own Mac or PC. Uh, so there's less overhead with Docker, which is super, super compelling. And in fact, in a little bit, I think we can demo a tool that CS50 built called CS50 CLI, Command Line Interface, which um, Adam is perhaps a solution to your problem or your interest there, whereby we can just run a command, CLI 50 enter, and voila, you're running Linux within a split second on your Mac. And I go in and out of Linux all the time on my Mac thanks to that tool. And are you you're typically doing most of your actual development in Mac, probably, right? On a Mac using Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Honestly, and why? Maybe let me. Uh, let me. Why? Someone asks on there. Um, I mean, I like Macs in terms of like the user interface. They're just pleasant to use. It talks to your iPhones and whatever other devices you have. So it's kind of a nice environment. The hardware is great, um, but all of our software runs on Linux. I prefer the Linux environment. I'm not such a fan of Darwin uh, just because of uh, conventions that they have. Um, and so you kind of get the best of both worlds this way. I still use my own terminal window on the Mac, but inside that window is Linux. So um, David the human uses Max, and David the programmer uses Linux. So you're not as inclined to use a VM to get the Ubuntu interface as much because you have the Mac interface, but the actual development. Yeah, I don't care about the actual development without needing all the overhead of a full VM. Yeah, I don't care for GNOME or any of the other window managers. They just don't solve any problems that Mac OS doesn't. Gotcha. How do you edit your sources.list without an editor to install an editor? Oh, uh, without an editor. So. Theoretically, you should not have to update sources.list because by default from Ubuntu, you should have a list of all of the URLs via which you can get the standard distribution of Ubuntu software. So apt get update should update your uh, cache of, um, of URLs essentially and of package names and versions and apt get install will then install those. You're only in a bind if you have no text editor and you want to install third party text editor that's in some other repository for which you have to edit your sources.list file, in which case the easiest approach is just install Vim or Nano or Emacs or whatever from the standard repository and then go and edit the file. But honestly, if you're comfy with Linux or learn a bit more about Linux command lines, uh, or really this is um, uh, bash command lines, you can do something like, uh, let me go back into the VM, cat etsy apt, uh, what is it, sources.d. No, nope, sources.list. Yeah, here it is. So here's a line for, in, let's not do the security line. Let's do the more generic one up top. So all of these lines here just refer to where can you get from Ubuntu's archives more software. You could do something like this. Uh, echo this string onto, this is the append operator, the end of atsy uh, apt apt, uh, what did I call it, sources.list and hit enter and that would concatenate onto the end of the file exactly that string and with very, very high probability will something like echo or cat be installed uh, because they're either built into bash or they're part of the core utilities that are installed. It looks like Sugmin has a very similar um, suggestion here. Mm-hmm. Um, small Linux version named Alpine which Docker image like five megabytes if I don't remember uh, incorrectly. Alpine Linux? Yeah, I know a little bit about it. Uh, five megabytes. Yeah, no, I mean, they're super small distributions of Linux. We have not bothered with that because, frankly, we want access to some of the more popular packages. And honestly, Debian and Ubuntu just have so much uh, momentum these days that anytime software comes out for Linux, it's almost always packaged for uh, the deb format. So we just use that um, and the, the whole ecosystem that comes with it. So we actually pay the price of bigger images but it just makes our lives easier. We don't have to compile software from source just to get it up and running. Sure. 
Twitch Hello World saying, main advantage of Docker, it compartmentalizes what runs on it separately as contrasted with the heavier overhead of a VM. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, yes, much, much less overhead, which is pleasant. Lilia uh, Via Vargas, who I believe is on Facebook, uh, is joining yeah. us. Yeah, hello. First time she's joined us on, uh, on Twitch, so hello, Lilia. Welcome aboard. Good to have you. Um, but. Yeah, exactly. So this uh, commenter here, uh, Sugmin, uh, Alpine is very small, yes, but it does not contain glibc, I think. I'm not sure about that, but I, I believe you. And a lot of the regular Linux software is not supported. Absolutely on that last point, for sure. Okay. Uh, GX Evolves, does Harvard provide lecture videos for all of their CS courses? Uh, not all, no, relatively few are online. Harvard's Extension School does provide some others if you want to type maybe www.extension.harvard.edu, uh, but there is tuition for those courses. There's relatively few free courses available at the moment via uh, open courseware for free. They also say, you're famous, bro. Thanks for your passion. Oh, that could be about you. Yeah, I think that's about you. Um, the whole school isn't free, uh, which is Adamantine that was saying, which is what you just said about the extension stuff. Um, you're the guy who lectured about scalability. Love that video. Oh, nice. I like that one, too. And uh, let's check out CS75. Yeah, CS75 and 76 are getting a little old, to be honest. Um, but I would uh, certainly check out. If you go to uh, ed, actually, can I type a URL here, yeah, too? Sure. Um, so if you go to uh, edx.org slash CS50, you can see all of CS50's currently available sites um, and see uh, what's available for free there. All right, so just getting us set up for the next bit. So should we actually transition maybe to CLI 50, yeah. um, partly for Adam's sake, for instance? Yeah, sure, let's do that. So if anyone wants to play around with something that's a little more accessible, perhaps, let me suggest uh, that you go back to uh, CS50's documentation, cs50.readthedocs.io. And if you look in the menu for CLI 50, command line interface 50, this is just a Python script, really, that we wrote that makes it easier to run Docker commands. And honestly, this is why I forgot how to run the command before, because I always <laughs> use this, which, to be fair, I wrote. So I knew it at one point, just not 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, so here, if you follow these instructions, you can install CLI 50 yourself. But per the documentation here, step one and two, you're going to want to install Docker first and Python 3.6, uh, because both of those are dependencies of CLI 50. Okay. But what I love about this tool, if I may say so myself, is that we use it all the time to actually develop software and work in a Linux environment with honestly without having to type these crazy long commands that clearly I can't remember. So I just run CLI 50 anytime I want to run um, a Linux environment and voila. There's a little more output here because what's going on? You'll see that one by default it's using the latest tag called latest which is a Docker convention uh, pulling from CS50 CLI. You don't have to name your images using weird hashes. You can give them more descriptive names. So our image is called CS50 slash CLI and I'll pull that up in a web browser soon. Here's my crazy long hash for it. Uh, it doesn't have to pull anything because it's up to date because I got my laptop ready before the stream. Um, there's some um, port mapping going on here. We very often do web development inside containers and I want to make sure that inside my container if I have a web server it's accessible on my Mac or PC. So these are port mapping. So if I have a server running inside the container on 8080 TCP, I have mapped it pseudo randomly to 32,773 and then I can actually have multiple web apps on my Mac all running on port 8080 inside the containers but exposed so to speak to my Mac on different ports which is great for development purposes. Well, cool, yeah, because then you can test within your Mac. You don't have to worry about testing within the Linux. Yeah, exactly. You'll see one of the first features we made was uh, print out this string. This is CS50 CLI. I also changed the default directory in CS50 CLI and changed the prompt a bit. And we pre-installed a lot of software in advance so that it's all just readily available to you, among them Vim here. So why don't we fast forward now? Let me show you the Docker file for CS50 CLI. Sure, let's take a look at it. So all of these images are freely available, as is Docker and Python and everything else we've, we've been talking about. If I go to, let me find my image, um, Docker Hub. So if you go to hub.docker.com slash r for repository slash CS50, you'll see all of CS50's free Docker images. And if you pick the one called CLI, you'll see this interface here. There's not too much you can do on Docker Hub other than see what, um, what images are available. But what's cool is that here you can actually see the Docker file we made for this image. Now it's a little uh, cryptic looking and we don't have to go all into the details because a lot of this is just Linux stuff, not Docker stuff. But you'll see the following. 
This image does not inherit from the Ubuntu image. It actually inherits from a parent image CS50 makes called base image, which is a generic layer we use across all of our images. More on that in a moment. Um, user and arg, these are just lower level details. Let me wave my hand at them for now. Um, expose is relevant though. This is saying go ahead and expose those three ports to the outside Mac or PC, just like Cloud9 on which CS50 IDE is based. So that's so that we can mimic CS50 IDE on our Macs and PC. Um, by default, so to um, uh, just like in Alpine, not all software comes by default. Same on the Ubuntu Docker image. You don't even get the man pages by default because they're blacklisted to save space. That's not good for us pedagogically. So we go in and put them back, essentially, nice. by way of this line, by unexcluding something that was excluded. Okay. So now we're doing some really funky stuff here using some Linux commands to make sure that we are reinstalling them. This is a little more obvious. Here we have now a run line that spans multiple lines. In Linux, if you uh, do a backslash and then hit enter, it's not going to move you to the next command. It's going to let you finish your thought on the next line. So all those backslashes just mean this is a really long apt get install line. Um, and you'll see, there it is, vim and like dozens of other programs that we, uh, or a couple dozen other programs that we use as well okay, cool. in the yeah. class. Much cleaner than having them all on one massive line. Yeah, it's just unmaintainable. So yeah. here now we use a lot of JavaScript stuff in the class, Node.js and in, in internally, not in the class pedagogically. Uh, but I wanted to install these tools here, one of which we do use in CS50, HTTP server. We use in like the middle of CS50 to run your own HTTP server, literally. Uh, we have a few gems in Ruby that we tend to use in CS50. 50s various platforms, so we pre-install those here. A lot for uh, Markdown, it looks like. Yeah, all Markdown related to a lot of our text-based uh, websites. Um, here are some Python packages, some related to Amazon Web Services. Um, these are just comments I made to myself, frankly, so I remember what these lines do. Some of our own tools there, too. Yeah, you can install our tools for free. Help 50, Render 50, Submit 50, and others um, via PIP, which is pa Python's package manager. Render 50 is a pretty cool tool. I do. We could do a whole session on that one, actually, how to make PDFs. Actually, that'd be pretty cool, actually. You can see that I have my notes to self temporary. Uh, there are bugs or missing features in some of the software that's open source that we use. So we fix uh, on specific branches or tags sometimes so that we can uh, mitigate any of those issues. Um, and then lastly, you just can see that I'm installing some files, config files. We don't have to go poking around too much. But here, this is my favorite feature. We have a message of the day, which every day is this is CS50 CLI. And you can see I'm using that echo trick. I'm echoing a string. This is CS50 CLI. And this time, I'm just blowing away the file if it's even there so that the only message of the day, MOTD, is that particular file. And then lastly, just like on Cloud9, we're adding jharvard to the sudoers, giving it uh, admin privileges as well. Pretty cool. So that escalated quickly, to be fair. But this was after weeks or months of sort of realizing, oh, we need this tool, or oh, we should add this, and build and build and build. And let me just real quick open up base image, the thing on which it's based. So we use CS50 base image for check 50, for all of our web apps, for CLI 50, and I think one or two other things as well. And that just has even more common software, like Clang and Curl and Git, that we want across all of CS50's usage of Docker. We just factored it out, like right. good design. Yeah. Yeah, and all together, I mean, it's not that monolithic. No, no, and it's a pretty nice hierarchy. I mean, that's what this is. We're making a family tree. CS50 base image is the root. We then have CS50 CLI. We've got another called CS50 server, which we can perhaps pull up later. Um, and then we have a few others that are a little leaner for uh, efficiency. And no more vhosts. No more vhosts. I mean, that's what we've gotten rid of. We used to have a pair of servers, two servers, running Apache and an old version of Linux that honestly is still on like Ubuntu. 12 or something. something like I mean, that's the problem, too. If you want to update your operating system, you have to put your entire server at risk because, God forbid, something goes wrong, you've just screwed up your whole system. So with containers, they are disposable. If I screw up a container, no big deal. Exit, rerun it, and I'm back in business. So for folks deploying web apps, this is probably, probably the future of most companies trying to deploy their business on, the, well, at least if they're on their own, well, probably even on, on AWS too, right? Yeah, I think for the foreseeable future, not necessarily Docker specifically, but uh, like C was mentioned earlier, containerization, and I'm sure humans will come up with something better after that. But yeah, these are kind of replacing what uh, were virtual machines for some time. And in fact, a lot of people are running virtual machines on bare metal and then running Docker on virtual machines. And if you're using AWS, Azure, or uh, Google, you're running on VMs by definition of how they run their architecture. It seems like good damage control, like you were talking about. Yeah, for sure.
Um, GX Evolved looks like they're also asking about CS uh, 550, CS 161, 121, and 124. Mm, that might be a typo. No such thing as CS 550. Uh, CS 161 is operating systems. Uh, not of uh, is available through Harvard's. Ex might be available through Harvard's Extension School. CS 121 definitely is. That's introduction to theory uh, in CS. And CS 124 definitely is. That's introduction to algorithms and data structures. Uh, those are at www.extension.harvard.edu. But they're not free. You would have to pay tuition, but you do get a transcript and course credit. And they're not. CS 50 hasn't produced those courses. Those are other instructors. Other instructors, other, other groups, yeah. Um, Surotanzas have to go. Actually, they're probably already long gone at this point. But if they're still in the stream, thank you very much for tuning in. Appreciate it. Um, what sort of cost is it, says Adamantine Bipartite, to make the CS50 IDE available to everyone for edX and Harvard? Um, it's a good question. It depends on how many people are using it. Um, and we're actually in the process of transitioning to AWS because Cloud9 was recently acquired by Amazon itself. Uh, so ask that question again in a few months when we have a better sense of what the new architecture is like. Yeah, because they're saying even if you're using Docker, it seems like you must maintain a massive infrastructure. Uh, yeah, definitely depends on the number of students, but uh, thanks to the cloud, it can grow and shrink as needed. And ME4L mentioned just what you just did, saying that it's not, uh, quote unquote, the CS50 IDE per se, mm -hmm. uh, exactly. underneath the hood at least, section IDE provided by Amazon call, call, uh, called Cloud9. Yes, not Cloud0, Cloud9. <laughs> Indeed, it's an open source tool that is hosted now by Google and, and also now by Amazon instead, uh, that we have layered pedagogical features on top of. Sugmin was asking, do you have any resources on creating the base images of Docker files? And we took a look, certainly, at our own base image. I don't know if there's more you would want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you, they're a little comp. Um they're a little complicated in that they have you know, weeks worth of thought and effort and therefore additional software. But honestly, you're welcome to just look at CS50's Docker images. All of them are here at uh, hub.docker.com slash u slash CS50. And I said R earlier. I wonder what happens if we visit the repository version. Oh, yeah, that works fine, too. It redirects, so they're fine. Um, you can see all of our images here. Um, and honestly, the easiest one to start with it's probably CLI. I mean, just ignore anything you don't understand and exclude it from your own Docker file and just take those baby steps and each time do docker build dot to actually run it in your current directory. Just a quick tour here. Um, server we use for all of our web applications, whereas CLI is for command line only. CS50 check, this is the base image, not documented. It's done. It's just not documented, hence the to-do, that we use for check 50 on the server if you want to see how that works. Base image I just pulled up. Sandbox is used by sandbox.cs50.io now, um, and I'll pull that up in a second. Um, IDE is used by the new version of the IDE offline. MySQL, we actually have our own image of MySQL just so that we can fix it on a specific version, but it's not our software, it's just our image. Travis CI is something we've used with Travis CI, which is a, um, a continuous integration deployment uh, technology. Uh, SMTP is our own SMTP server. And that's it. There's not too much here. And in fact, Sandbox, if you go to sandbox.cs50.io, and actually, do you mind pasting that in? Sandbox.cs50.io. That's, yep, CS50's new platform for quick and dirty programming. And it is based on Docker 2 and a company called CodeEvolve that runs the servers. You can see in our Docker file everything that is installed on here. This is still a work in progress, which is why the to-do is there. And uh, at the moment, because of the way it's configured, we don't have lines of complexity in the Docker file. We instead do this. We copy a script called cs50.sh into temp. We then run that script and then remove it. So you would actually have to look at our GitHub repo for this, which is also open source. And if I go into cs50 slash sandbox on GitHub, you'll see this file, cs50.sh. And here you can see what is just a bash script with all of our apt get lines. So the only difference here is there's no run lines, there's no command or entry point. So don't confuse the two. But this is all the lines that install for you all the stuff you see for free on sandbox.cs50.io. Oh, cool. Really cool. I mean, it's amazing. Back in the day, and still now, and it's still the very popular, you have things like Chef and Puppet. These are tools via which you can orchestrate your servers and pre-install software. But it's like this script here, cs50.sh uh, just uh, bootstraps your setup, and it installs manually all this software. But there's no caching. There's no layering. So Docker is just kind of a better version of these scripts that have emerged over time. Just trying to save as much time as possible in like the tedium of getting all this stuff up and running. Yeah. Essentially, it looks like that's what the goal is. 
a yeah. lot of it. Yeah, no, and you can freeze the image, which is amazing. You can make your images freely available or even privately available so people can just do Docker pull and pull down your image for free. Yeah, super cool technology. It makes it really easy, it looks like. Uh, uh, how about this one? Is GitHub Pages, similarly to Heroku, a container-like Docker? Pro no, it's not. Um, I am pretty sure that GitHub Pages is just the fancy word for a CDN, Content Delivery Network, specifically hosted by a company called Fastly.com, I believe, F-A-S-T-L-Y. Um, and that is just a static service for hosting static web pages, which is exactly what GitHub Pages is. So there's no need for any computation. That is all disk-bound um, service. Cool, cool. Um, do you have any resources? Okay, that was what we just read. Sorry. What was Google's plan? Uh, containerized browsing or something? Everyone, everything for on the client side. They did have something like that. It was like a um, sort of related to, I guess, WebAssembly or um, maybe. I think Rob was doing some research on it at one point. I don't know the specifics, but I do think that's the future because honestly, Mac OS, Windows, and Linux are all a huge mess right now in terms of the security model. When you install software right now, consider on your Mac or PC, you're prompted for admin privileges, at which point all bets are off. That product you just downloaded, free or not from the internet, can do anything it wants on your computer. That is a horrible, horrible design that we've been stuck with for decades. So any steps toward containerization client-side is most likely a very good thing. Yeah, sounds like it'd be pretty cool. Uh, world domination, says Andre. That's Google's plan. Um, ha, ha, ha. And in fact, it used to be don't be evil, but that's not even the plan anymore. Oh, yeah. So be evil. Be evil. Maybe say a question, how is this different from Cloud9, Google Cloud, AWS services, says Bavik. Um, Docker is a well, Cloud9 is a web-based IDE that happens to be hosted typically in the cloud on some service. Google Cloud and AWS services are more similar to each other. Microsoft Azure as well would be in that bucket. Those are infrastructure as a service, but they also have platform as a service stuff. And frankly, they have software as a service stuff. But Docker is a piece of software that you can use on those architectures. In fact, if I can share a screen here, uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk is a service that Amazon makes available, similar in spirit to Heroku, but it's Amazon specific, and Elastic Beanstalk lets you run Docker containers on Amazon's virtual machines, on Amazon's bare metal, their physical servers. So when I develop an app on my Mac in a container, I can test it and run it and play with it locally. I can then just push that container essentially to AWS, Elastic Beanstalk. Amazon then runs the exact same image, which is extraordinary because it means what I am running on my Mac is gonna behave theoretically exactly the same way it's gonna behave it on the cloud. I mean, years ago, what used to happen, if you and I were collaborating and we had our v -host our central servers, I would have to tell you, oh, Colton, go ahead and uh, Vim, uh, install Vim, uh, install Apache, install these libraries. I mean, each of us has to d agree to install the same things, uh, or we have to use Chef or Puppet or, um, or Vagrant or other tools that facilitate that. Docker just hides all of that, and you don't have to worry about touching your Mac and nor me mine. Cool. Yeah, it definitely seems like it saves a lot of uh, time and energy these days. Kubernetes is also an alternative to this, uh, po very popular in, in Google circles as well. Um, they're all based on Ubuntu. I meant more like Scratch. Uh, not sure if that's a. In, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's the, a response to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think you need a base image, says Benny Blanco 87. Mm -hmm. You can make your own base image, but I think most people don't do that. You just start with some distro you like. Um, oh yeah, you said right here you can create one like, just like the Ubuntu images maintained. Yeah, because the main maintenance is probably a big thing. Doing something that's maintained actively probably more safe bet than doing something from scratch. Yeah, let me pull up in answer to this question the Ubuntu base image. So here we are on uh, hub.docker.com again slash underscore. Underscore is the uh, the official images that come from Docker itself, slash Ubuntu, and you'll see this here, and you'll see that they have a crazy number of, well, no, not as crazy as it used to be. 
<laughs> they have uh, crazy. only a few supported tags these days. I was using 1804, and there's some synonyms for those there. Um, and here you can see a lot of documentation, probably some instructions in here on how they made these images. And you can keep reading what is Ubuntu for folks who are a little new to it. Um, yeah, here we go. Oh, here we go. This image is built from official root FS file system tarballs provided by Canonical, specifically those images there. Um, so it looks like you can deep dive deeper into how you make these images if you really want. Um, so that's available too. Cool. Yeah, if you wanted to go a little bit deeper dive. Do you think most people would have reason to do something like that? To really Doc, make your base image? Yeah. I probably wouldn't bother. Yeah, probably too much work. I mean, the base images are already pretty trim, so unless you really want to customize things, it's probably not necessary. Sure. Um, Twitch Hello World is asking, I'm confused by the term base images. Is it documentation just to remind you what is in it, or is it functional as in setting up the files and or folders in the container? It's a little more like the latter, the second thing you proposed. It is one or more layers of software that you want to install into a container is perhaps the best way to say it. Sort of like the bootstrap, the foundation upon which to build your... Yeah, it's, it's harder to create a base image than it is to create child images. We have created child images. There are one-liner where we just said from Ubuntu 1804, and then our two-liner where I installed Vim, or three-liner when I installed Vim, app get update and then installed Vim, um, and CLI 50, which is much longer as well. Is it accurate to think of base images sort of as like the operating system and child images as sort of being the actual applications built on top of that? Um, I'm sure there are some the child things. images include additional software. The base image includes minimally the, the operating system itself. Uh, the child images contain more stuff okay. to, make, to be technical. Got it. Uh, I can re recommend Docker Compose also when you've learned the basics of Docker and want to have a very nice wrapper interface. Yeah, let's come back to that because we too use Docker Compose uh, for our web applications, especially when we have multiple servers like the web server and also uh, a database server like MySQL. So let's come back to that. Cool. Add my bar pie. I'm liking Docker. I might use it. Uh, Lancemaker, is it secure to install lots of files this way in your computer? Is the Docker image sealed from the environment? Secure. Uh, I don't know what you mean by secure. Um, if someone has physical access to your computer or can SSH into your computer, they can get at anything that's in the image. Uh, they can just run the image just like I did with run-it and then the tag name. Uh, so let me say no. And there's nothing about Docker that we've discussed that's any more or any less secure than any other files on your computer. Um, you can make the containers privileged, and they can then have access to your host network, etc. Says Sigmund Penny. Uh, well, if we answer the question from the other direction, when you're running the container, theoretically, it should not be able to access the host system, the Mac or PC, unless you mount inside of it, as we did eventually, uh, one or more directories. But yes, there's also privileged mode, which gives the container even more access to the host OS, like networking ports and so forth, and more. Um, so you should assume, honestly, any software you're running on your computer can potentially break out in the case of, of, of bugs or exploits. Sure, makes sense. Um, using persistent storage, shared volumes between hosts and the container, those files can then be changed from within the container. This is essentially what you just said. Um, will Docker be faster than a VM on my local machine? Uh, I would say most likely, but there's probably some factors that could refute that. But ten, generally, a VM is a little heavier weight. It's doing more work to run your software, whereas Docker and tools like it are leaning more on the host OS. Okay. Um, Docker's designed to use a single container for heavy processing. It's designed to be a cluster, like the diagram we looked at before. Is that accurate? So, well, that was the original intent, honestly. Um, but increasingly, it's being used for isolation. And so, yes, there's this, this notion of microservices, where you have a bunch of different uh, pieces of software that you've implemented, one for your web server, one for your app server, one for your email server, one for your um, database server or whatnot. And in CS50, we kind of do that. We separate out our web app from our database, but we don't use microservices. Honestly, I find in many cases, certainly for small applications, it's just over-engineering the problem. And it's nice to just bundle everything up in one container. Frankly, a lot of cloud services just make it easier to get one container up and running as opposed to multiple. However, you can with Elastic Beanstalk and other services. Um, so that was the original intent. But frankly, we at least, and I, I dare say others, definitely have heavier weight images than might have been originally intended. Okay. Um, Ahmed Osman says, is Docker separating the dev environment from production? 
You could, you could have multiple instances of the same image running in separate containers so as to have a test environment, a production environment, a staging environment, makes it even easier because you know by definition all three of those are identical. By contrast, in our years ago with vHost, virtual hosts, we would have to configure two or three servers identically and then hope we don't screw up and let them get out of sync. Sure. Docker ensures they won't. Um, what would be the proper approach to not losing data? I understand you can quickly reinstall stuff, but what about data stored like in databases, images, etc.? So it depends on where things are running. Docker can certainly do this. You can create, as someone suggested earlier, your own local volume, which is essentially like a file in which you store virtually all of the files from the container or a folder therein. Um, and that's where you can put images and stuff. Databases can be outside of the container. That's how what we do on Elastic Beanstalk. We run our Docker containers on Elastic Beanstalk but we run our databases on RDS, uh, Relational Database Service, which is a separate Amazon product. So that takes care of the persistence of data. Um, but you can certainly persist data. I was just demonstrating that by default, everything is ephemeral, unless you mount and remember to mount and create your own volumes. Okay. Uh, Benny Blanco says malware can break out of VMs, so it can probably break out of containers. Is that true? Yes, software, it, people, software is written by humans, humans make mistakes, things can get out, so you should mitigate those risks always anyway. Uh, Elasorsa says, uh, you usually don't keep your database in your instance, you use it through a volume, so it's more on your server. Yep, I agree with that. Uh, I guess you can put it on a host directory and mount to it, or run a scheduler to back up on a mounted. Sure. Uh, what is the best free platform to host Docker images, says uh, Light of Hell one I don't know. Let me quickly Google. All right, so it looks like Heroku supports Docker these days. Um, I know Heroku tends to have free tiers of service up to like low levels of usage. I would uh, defer to you to just read a little closer the documentation to see if the Docker stuff is free. Um, you can definitely use AWS. You have to typically sign up with a credit card. Even if you don't get charged, you get some amount of usage for free. Um, and certainly through educational programs, sometimes CS50 has done this. We've gotten like coupon codes for $100 of, of usage. Then you could definitely use Elastic Beanstalk. Um, and I'm guessing Azure has something similar maybe Google does too. So I would honestly Google Docker free hosting and see what pops up initially if you want to play. But you can run Docker on your own Mac and PC, of course, if that's not on the internet. Okay. Um, I remember the good old appliance data yeah. hypervisors. Then you must remember how slow that damn thing was to boot up because it was, in fact, a hypervisor. Uh, talking from experience in production, the more processes you add to a Docker container, the more problems you get and you get to rely on init managers like Supervisor D. I prefer running one to two processes per container like Nginx or some service, plus yep. some service. That's fair. The thing, that's get, that world is getting better, managing processes and containers. Um, but yes, that's the intent of microservices. Containers do not contain in quotes I read today, which means that security is not isolated. Um, I'd have to see the article to be able to tease that apart. Uh, you should not assume that anything is secure, but this is certainly a step in secure 100%. Uh, but this approach to containerizing or more generally isolating processes and services is a huge step forward. Uh, running a database inside a Docker container, I would seriously not recommend that. It's not easily deployable, says Sugman. I don't know if I'd agree with that, honestly. I mean, MySQL and Postgres and such, they're just pieces of software that are running. The most important thing with a database is the volume. And you want to make sure that that is mounted consistently. You want to make sure that uh, the process shuts down cleanly so you don't have any corruption. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't run the database uh, software in a container. Um, but the data should be separate from it. Sure. Wouldn't want a. Uh sort of ephemeral database that... No, know, that would be the worst. <laughs> um, but actually, can I interject for a moment? Sure. Just because we can tie that thread nicely into the other question about Docker Compose that came up. Yeah, see that. Um, let me go ahead and open up, um, let's say, our Help50 uh, server. So Help50 servers uh, is freely accessible on GitHub, though you probably wouldn't want to run this yourself. This is at github.com slash cs50 slash help50 server. Um, this is the code that drives most of Help50 itself, the command line tool. There's a backend server to which students' uh, error messages are posted via HTTP, and we then send back some helpful response, theoretically helpful responses based on regular expressions. Excuse me. And you can see in here we have a Docker file for that. 
and that has just a few pieces of software installed, but notice we have an abstraction here. Um, all of CS50's web-based apps extend what's called CS50 server, which in turn extends CS50 CLI, which in turn extends CS50 base image, which in turn extends Ubuntu 18.04. I believe. So we have this whole hierarchy so that each of our apps has a pretty tight Docker file, not much complexity, but we have the commonalities factored it's out. It's like a Java program. Uh, yes, but without the atrocious headaches. <laughs> and, but you can see here that Help50 Server, unlike some of our apps, additionally needed this Flask Migrate library, Flask SQL Alchemy, Flask Session, and a couple of others that we didn't bother baking into our base image because not everything needs it. So sure. we just save a little bit of space, but we could throw the kitchen sink in too. But to someone's comment earlier about Docker Compose, this is a helpful file too. This is a somewhat older version of the format. There's actually a few more fancier features now. But here in Docker Compose, if you want to run multiple containers locally or in the cloud, you can compose them, so to speak. This text file specifies how you can run multiple, multiple containers and how they should be configured with respect to each other. So for instance, Help50 Server is a nice example of one of our web apps that has both a, app, a web server and a database server. When we're developing this app locally, we want to have a MySQL server running. But I don't really want to install it on my own Mac or PC or tell you how to do it and then synchronize our tables. That too should be containerized and abstracted away. So this file here has a top, this is YAML, which is like a a cleaner version of JSON data, a top level key called services, and I've defined two services, web and MySQL, but I could have called those foo and bar. Um, web should be built by building dot. So this is a way of automating that builds command. I gave it a name just so I know how to refer to it when I type things on. This is cool. You can say it depends on another server. And the syntax for this feature has changed uh, over the months. But this means it depends on this one down here so that my database server ultimately will definitely be running before my web server because I want, want the latter to connect to the former. Okay. So the rest of this stuff is just a bunch of environment variables. But what's cool here is we can stub out, so to speak, a default username and password password, the host name for the database, and a name. None of this is secure. This is just used locally for development. This is not our actual passwords. But you'll see here you have a link, which means uh, this line will make sure that your web server has a fake DNS entry called MySQL, that when you do an NS lookup of MySQL, it will resolve to the other container, wherever it is, which is cool. You can expose ports, like port 8080 to port 8080, because I just want to commandeer that one here. And here's why I got confused before. I'm not sure why Docker Compose is more tolerant of this. I'm mapping the current directory dot to serve slash dub dub dub, which is convention. And then down here, MySQL is based on our MySQL image, a couple more environment variables, which per the documentation configure a default username and password. And so here, if I were to run this after cloning the repo, I would do on my Mac Docker compose, whoops, build to build both images, and then Docker compose up to build the bring the whole architecture online. Okay. Where was the database being stored in that example, like the actual volume is server www? Nope, inside a, an ephemeral container. So when that container uh, called MySQL is deleted, I lose all my data. Okay, so it's just for testing, and then when you actually just deploy it, it's... That's a different database, right. So what ha we don't use Docker Compose in the cloud. We instead use Elastic Beanstalk and have it talk to RDS. But that is product specific, that's cloud provider specific. Here is a generic approach that allows us to create the, uh, to mimic Amazon on setup, but locally in such a way that it's it's disposable. Okay. Cool. Huge boon. So I'm glad. Thank you for mentioning uh, Docker Compose earlier. Yeah, that's cool. That you can sort of mix containers into the same setup. Yeah. Um, let me make sure we're back up to where we just left off. Oh, uh, looks like Force Sunlight included the Docker. Oh, good. Thanks. I'll try to pull that up later. Article, and then um, oh, someone else had another article. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, Thought the advantage of using a commercial interface as a service like AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure is the containerization and resulting security, says Twitch. Hello, world. Eh, don't buy anything based on someone saying it's secure, because that's usually fluffy marketing speak, I would say. The um, lock image on uh, yeah. whatever website. Their sign approved or whatever. Yeah. Always um, take that any mention of security with a grain of salt. Um, it is uh, using a, cloud a modern cloud provider, like the ones you've enumerated here, 
helps you be more secure if the alternative we're using like a vhost based a virtual host based approach of shared web hosting that used to be in vogue with that said shared web hosting was really popularized i think by the php world that was the way the system was designed you have one web server like apache maybe nginx running a bunch of different websites all in the same system but Ruby on Rails doesn't really work that way. Python and Flask and Django don't really work that way. Those are isolated to individual apps by design more so, and it's actually more of a pain to get them working in a shared environment. So these IAS providers um, are just more conducive to running uh, a more diverse ecosystem of apps, I would say. Colonel Hussein says, what are you doing here? What kind of code is this? And this is Docker. So if you rewind, once we post the final video, you'll see all that and more. Yeah, and they can actually, you can uh, go, uh, if the, the VOD currently, you should be able to scroll back on the slider. Oh, good, and see good, good. The, um, and look back at what we were talking about previously. Um, someone included an article that says, do not use Docker in Docker for CI. I'm not sure if you're... We'll sit and I'll pull that up later. Um, where do you use, oh, I was asking Sugman where they use Docker. Ahmed Osman says, uh, is it better if I have PHP-based platform that needs a gear of Python-based platform making both uh, on separate containers t uh, talking through APIs, or is there a way making them communicate uh, container to container? So if I'm hearing this correctly, if you've got a PHP app, but you need to call some Python code, I mean, honestly, the simplest way to do this is probably have one container, one image that has both PHP installed, whatever version you want, and Python installed, whatever version you want, and in PHP, just use the system call or exec or whatever it's called, it's been a long time, uh, that lets you run a Python script locally and not over-engineer that. I say that completely in the abstract, don't know what your, your actual needs are or your uh, architecture is like, but I would keep it simple until you need to complicate your implementation. Okay, makes sense. Um... Sigman was responding to Force Sunlight. Development environment just currently been working with Kubernetes. I'm not, I'm not Kubernetes. Like, Kubernetes and GCP for a couple of years. Totally don't know what that is. <laughs> um, Twitch uh, using one of those services does have the advantage of having them implementing best practices mm -hmm. for you. Very true. Bigger scale, more testing. That's a good one. Audits. Um, this article was cited by AWS Cloud9 because they don't allow running Docker inside their IDE due to security issues. That's yeah, the same that's true. article that was Same for us before. as a result. Uh, what is the difference with Docker and GCP? Uh, Docker is a technology, uh, Google Compute Platform. I think you can run Docker on Google's cloud platform. I, we've not used Google's uh, platform here much other than indirectly through other cloud services. Um, but Docker is a piece of software that allows you to contain all of your application's code and dependencies inside of the illusion of a self-contained operating system. GCP is, I believe, fair to say lower, well, no, it's more of a, isolated app environment. I think it's probably close enough to say Docker is a more generalized solution, but I need to close my mouth because I've not used Google enough to speak intelligently to that beyond that. Uh, is it me or is web programming really a confusing but powerful soup of dozens of technologies all carefully tied together? It is not just you. The world is a mess right now and it will probably always be a mess like this because many people will come up with many solutions to problems and our understanding of how best to solve problems will evolve over time. Uh, I think the important thing here in this world is to focus on fundamentals, like understand how technologies are similar and different, and just roll your eyes when someone is preaching one technology over another and decide for yourself based on reading the documentation, reading articles like folks are uh, proposing here, and then honestly just go with which one is easiest and most accessible to you. Um, and if you want bump up against problems ultimately, fine, solve those. Don't try to assume there's one best thing for everything. Sigman was saying, stay away from devices and services where they say military grade <laughs> encryption. Yeah, that's silly nonsense too. <laughs> uh, GCP's Google Cloud Platform. Uh, better buy the ones that have easily hacked on the package. There you go. Very open, forthright. Uh, where are the puns? Where can we find a full video of the feeds as Degoja? It'll be on here on Twitch uh, after the broadcast is over with. Um, it may take them a minute to encode it, and it'll be on YouTube later this evening. So if you're uh, unfamiliar, we have a YouTube channel as well where we post all these videos and many more videos, including David's lectures from uh, this last year. Yeah, week. you want to paste that URL? YouTube.com slash CS50 for all of CS50's uh, video needs. <laughs> uh, uh, all programmer says, hello. Hello. OK. <laughs> um, shell exec nastiness. Says yeah, there's that stuff. Know. But again, quick and dirty solution if you want. Um, comment Colton and Professor, don't stay quiet. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, same here, Asley, as TV right back at you. Go to the videos tab after this is done and you will find it. 
Um, Sigmund says, yeah, you can. They have a section just for Kubernetes, so you can set up your clusters there with Docker containers inside the pods in GCP, that is. Mm, so I guess they okay. have some integrate level of integration. OK. Um, what is Colton's middle name? Taylor is my middle name. Oh, wow. You could, we could have strung that out, Get, take some guesses, yeah. and a, po a poll or something. Okay. Kubernetes. There you go. Uh, I like all the humor in 2019 CS50 PSET instructions. Oh, thank you. All right, cool. Quite welcome. We're all, we're all caught up on the call. Yeah, I think we're nearing the end here. Please feel free to chime in with any final questions if you'd like. Oh, but sure, yeah. Time flew by. I didn't realize it was already almost 5 o'clock. Indeed. But let me suggest, if you'd like to get started, literally Google like Docker download. Install it on your Mac or PC, assuming your OS supports it. Um, then you can go about playing with like just the base Ubuntu image. I mean, honestly, let me pull up a little text editor. I believe the first thing we did was we created a Docker file that quite simply had from Ubuntu 18.04 at the top. Uh, so this was my Docker file, and then down here I just ran the command uh, docker build dot, and then I ran docker run dash it. Uh, whatever your hash is here. Now you can actually be fancier. You can tag your own images and give them names. I think, I don't want to goof here, but I think if you do tash foo, you can instead say foo here, I think, but double check. Um, if you want instructions, just go ahead and do docker uh, help or docker run help or docker build help or so forth, which is pretty conventional. And that'll get you up and running. I mean, it'll get you running Linux in this case, or there's uh, different flavors of Linux. I mean, honestly, if you are a bit of a geek and you want to learn more about various Linux distributions, don't bother like partitioning your hard drive and dual booting and all that scary stuff. Um, it's so easy to just run it in a container these days, get up and running, play, install stuff, and throw it away when you're done. Yeah, it was easy even with um, like VMware doing that. And yeah. let alone this makes just it a little more time consuming, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this makes it even easier and much more lightweight. Yeah. yeah. Much faster. Uh, could we make an, a stream about building multi tenant architectures? Maybe I would propose that you uh, formulate a more precise question for us. Like, what's the problem you're trying to solve, and why do you want a multi tenant architecture, and what does that mean to you and to us, um, rather than uh, our trying to answer, I think, in the abstract? Um, it looks like Unsigned Ed says, Hi, David and Colton. Thank you for your great job. And special to you, David, to introduce me to the wonderful world of programming. Oh, very nice. Very welcome, Unsigned Ed. And I think they're having a conversation in the chat here asking, um, I think, Sugman or someone who asked. Um, Adamantine, sorry, says, Any, Is anybody working as a programmer or developer? And people are chiming in. It looks like. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Digicrest says, Not yet. And then Adamantine was saying. Okay. Oh, here we go. Big one. OK. Think, do you agree and think operating systems or algorithms is a good such course to take in person? Uh, if that question is to us, I'm not sure it matters, to be honest. I think it depends on the quality of the program, the instructor, the assignments, um, far more so than being in person. I think it's certainly nice to get to know um, the teaching staff and classmates in person, but I don't Think, nothing comes to mind about those two topics that lend themselves better or worse to in-person. Honestly, if you had asked more about a, a physics class or a club that has a hands-on lab, or especially from the physical sciences, absolutely. Um, but when it comes to most CS classes, certainly theory and software, I'm not sure you really gain much. If it were a hardware class or a circuitry class uh, akin to a physics class, then sure. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about that distinction, I think. I mean, certainly we spend a lot of time and resources making our content available to people around the world to watch online. Yeah. So yeah, it follows. Yeah. Why do CS50 stopped CS50 coding event, which we had to make a team for and solve ten or so problems and see? Rank stuff in. Oh yeah, the coding contest. Uh, there wasn't huge uptake to be honest. Um, we ran it I think twice, and each time we had a good amount of participation, but not nearly as much as with like CS50X Puzzle Day, which we'll be running in a couple months time. Um, so it just didn't seem like there was sufficient interest. I dare say when people are immersed in taking CS50 or some of CS50's other courses. There's already so much damn work to do that I'm not sure doing more problems uh, in code was uh, globally appealing. Uh, but if you start asking more and more and get your friends to mention it, maybe we can marshal some more support. Sure, yeah. That's all. Um, what, Saul GD, why are all the questions in caps? Like everyone's shouting today. I don't know why all the questions are in caps uh, here. Can't hear out of my right ear. <laughs> um, always great to hear from people who are passionate about technology. Thanks, guys, says the Goja. Um, I think one thing is coding with another student too to train 
Um, and there's, I think, certainly value in that, right? Pair programming. But Maybe. I've never been a fan. Online. I can't stand working alongside of someone else on code. I can't focus, and I'm too embarrassed by typing what I'm typing. Oh, like what we're doing right now? Well, we're not coding. We're just talking. <laughs> when is the World Puzzle Day? Uh, to be determined, it will be somewhere between February and April of 2019. We will start posting on social media pretty soon when we know. Cool. Um, Whipstreak was asking, can we do a stream on HTML? I know it's not a programming language per se, but I love, 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 love HTML, CSS. But then maybe you should be leading the stream on HTML and CSS. Yeah. Um, but that's a good one. Let me. Uh, we'll talk to the team here and see who might uh, be interested in doing that one. Um, regulars, we can pair up. Says for sunlight. Um, does beta testing for you guys satisfy that idea somewhat? Why teach C? Oh, sorry, that's not the not the same person. Does beta testing for you guys satisfy that idea somewhat? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Yeah. Why teach C and not C++ for the first half of the course, says Adam Mantine. 60, 70 percent of our students have never programmed before. I think pedagogically, uh, procedural programming uh, is best uh, placed before object-oriented pro programming because I think there's so many problems and so much logic you can explore that does not warrant uh, objects until you actually have problems that warrant solving them with it down the road. So I think if we were to introduce C++, it would be after C, uh, or you would teach C++, but the subset of it that is effectively C. Um, and it's really not until mid-semester when we switch to Python and we start talking about libraries and frameworks that it makes sense sense to begin encapsulating more complexity and to uh, use it, using other people's libraries. I just don't think it solves a problem early on in a class. And syntactically, there's a little more messiness there. I don't see a need for classes early on. And even in years ago, when a colleague and I used to teach an introduction to computer science in Java, I never really liked it very much because it felt unnatural to me to be forcing students to, to see and to think about classes when, oh my god, they just want to write hello world, let alone any number of other programs that don't require a class. That is a, an annoying feature of Java, I think, that everything's a class so and object. We'll switch to Java then next semester. There you go. All right, um, time for a couple more questions here. Yeah, Cymbeline Dragonborn says, Doc requires Windows 10 Pro Enterprise or Education. I have access to a Mac, but not Windows 10 Pro, et cetera. Is it better to try and learn Docker on a Mac rather than upgrade my Windows 10 to Pro? Yes, less work and no upsides to trying it on Windows anyway. They're going to be functionally pretty much the same. I want to give Bisquit a shout out to his C++ skills. So shout out to Bisquit. I'm not sure who that is. Um, what was the reason you guys changed PHP to Python in CS50? PHP is just lost steam. Uh, Python is all the rage these days. Ruby was more of the rage for some time. Python is a bit more versatile. Like the ra You can write command line programs in PHP. You can do analysis uh, and sort of data science -y type applications in PHP, but that's not really what it was meant for, and it's just weird to do that or to teach that. Uh, so as such, I think Python is more multi-talented, or it certainly is perceived as being more multi-talented. Um, and so it just felt like it was time. We were clinging to a language that was whose star was fading. Um, with that said, PHP's documentation, I've long felt, is order of magnitude better than Python's and Ruby's. Uh, so I do think that was a law. They have a wonderfully accessible uh, documentation, great examples, even some community Q&A. Python's documentation, I think, is awful uh, relative to that. Um, but I do think it was the right call. Otherwise, we'd be teaching the wrong language for a course, one of whose goals is not just a foundation in computer science and concepts and programming, but also to offboard students so that when they never take another CS course before, they nonetheless have some practical programming experience that they can and then go use in the real world. Agreed. Are you planning to teach any functional programming languages like Elixir and Elm? No time soon, but Colton has been uh, championing that for some time, so maybe, but no plans just yet. Get more critical mass. Let's ask him. Keep asking. <laughs> uh, I prefer working solo. The hard is good to do it in one course, since that is how coders work, says Twitch Hello World. Uh, collaboratively, not necessarily next to each other as peer programming, uh, but that's just my own personal bias against. You and I can uh, do a little bit of that next stream. We'll do okay, I'll just sit here and watch, <laughs> see how you feel. How can I be one of the CS50 staff? I'm really interested in that since like CS50X in 2013. Oh. Awesome. Uh, just e uh, start by emailing me, Malin at, do you want to paste Malin at harvard.edu? Um, and we have bunches of ways to get involved, either officially here on campus or online, or certainly with our online communities as well. Tuxman, coming from C, I was so confused when I started my Java class, but then having seen structs, yeah. it came back to me and it was smooth. So I like that point, because we do get to structs in C mid-semester, at which point, oh, this does make 
makes sense. It solves a problem. I can encapsulate data. And so there, if C had uh, ob uh, classes, could you then say, well, you can encapsulate not only data, but functionality instead. And for me, at least mentally, I feel pedagogically, that's like the right way to escalate things and not hit students on day one with too much OO stuff. And I feel like, don't we do that with Python now around the time we get destructs? Don't we start to segue into Python in classes, or have we touched that briefly? We don't. Briefly? Uh, no, we just use dictionaries to encapsulate. Interesting. I thought in one of the lectures you talked years about Years ago, a, a couple years ago, we had a class for like PSET 7 where we encapsulated something, but then I dropped it as just being a, a tangent. Gotcha, OK. Should you use classes in object-oriented programming using jQuery, like in PSET 8 mashup? Not for that PSET, no. I mean, what we expect of you in, in what was mashup, uh, the old PSET 8, uh, was very procedural. In fact, just a few lines of code. And I'd be curious to see what you are proposing, but my gut tells me that's over-engineering the solution. Brenda's uh, mentioning Puzzle Day is not about programming, it's problem solving. Indeed, very true. Thank you, Brenda. Um, yes, anyone can participate in Puzzle Day. Keep an eye on CS50's Facebook or subreddit for that. More all caps. <laughs> it's Brenda Anderson from Discord. Nice. If you want to read about the last one, M. Kloppenberg. Yeah, thank you article. for pasting that URL. Um, for someone saying, super fun, never did it. My students had so much fun, thought we could try it, maybe. Yeah, I do, for sure. Uh, OK, there's our email. Okay, thanks for the link. Java was easier for me after C in Python, so I yeah, guess to your I point, bet. yeah, after a little bit of procedural knowledge. Um, took a while to get around polymorphism and interfaces, that's and that fair. sounds a little bit more Java specific too with interfaces. Um, as I said, exciting that everyone can participate. Thanks for that. Yeah, do check out that URL that, uh, who just pasted that up there? Uh, do you mind M. Kloppenberg, I believe, M uh, this one? Yeah, that would be great. There's a lot of photos. You can really see some of your friends and classmates and others uh, around the world, literally, who would print it out the puzzles and were working on them. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, they rem uh, roughly remember that. Yeah, a few that. thousand people, I think. Yeah. So, Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Feel free to uh, hit us up on social media or to just email me directly. My email address is in there, and it's on almost every one of our videos. Colton's as well uh, in the games videos um, and it's been really fun talking about this yeah. reach out if you've got some questions yeah thanks so much for uh, for this tutorial on docker I oh no problem too. yeah cool. looking forward to the next one when we'll be playing what game next uh, well actually we do need to beat Zelda at some point but um, I don't know um, we struggled with the first time the the uh, there was input lag because it was on audio. oh that's right it was the TV's fault it, really, it was my excuse it actually was the TV's there was a fault. millisecond that kept costing me lives oh, every time more than one more than one millisecond um, so join us next week on Monday. I'll be doing a stream on Hangman. We'll talk about Hangman. So pretty. Uh, You're just gonna be playing on the whiteboard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everyone gets a letter, please. <laughs> we'll implement uh, Hangman in Love 2D, um, and then Wednesday nice. we may do the typing game. Um, chatting with some other folks about other streams. They'll be in the Facebook. Um, we'll make some events for those. Um, this was Docker. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. much. Great to see everyone. And, and we, tune we, in had next time. we had a whiteboard. Yeah, we didn't need to draw any pictures. We but didn't really next use time it, we'll right? play Hangman, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah. Or, or maybe even do some uh, Legend of Zelda, finish Zelda up. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. This was CS50 on Twitch. And uh, this was Docker. We'll see you next week. Take care.